there are times when you add something to your life that it actually takes something vital away. Maybe you're someone who has a hard time saying no to a new opportunity. I am. When I was making this, my wife told me this. But you actually preach to yourself. It's like, but I full well know. The more yeses you, you give out, the more yeses you dole out, the less opportunity you can take on. And the more you take away from those you love. Or maybe it's the overtime at work that's really hard to resist. It goes from a good thing, goes from I need to feed my family, and I have to put a roof over my head. And then it goes to, if I add this many hours over the next six months, we can afford that second trip to Cabo. It can even be creating a profile on social media to keep track of our family and our friends. It starts with a good desire to connect. I want to get together with my family. I want to know what they're doing. And then it morphs into your life, where you never actually spend any time with your family. You're just on the internet. You see, we're, we're, very, we're very rarely satisfied with just a little bit more. Or it inevitably turns into the burden we carry on our back. You see, the Galatians, they, they dealt with this as well. They, they deal with the same stuff we deal with. They thought, as you see, well, maybe if I add this to the gospel. Because, because they say over there, those, those experts over there say, it can really help me feel engaged with God and feel his pleasure to the degree I don't really feel right now. Because as Paul goes on to say in chapter 5, much like he said, Two chapters earlier, if you add to the gospel, guess what you have left? No gospel. So Paul builds on his allegory from Galatians 4, the slave woman Hagar and the free woman Sarah to press into us our freedom. So as Christian, you are free. You are free as a citizen of the royal kingdom from above. That that's your actual heavenly abode. That's, that's actually where you are. It's not just where you're heading, although you are. You're, you're actually already there. You're already part of this. So that reminds you of the freedom, not that we're just looking forward to, you actually already have. You have freedom to turn from the yoke that you're about to put on. You're free, so why are you putting on a yoke? Why are you putting on the law? We'll develop this through the following three points. First, as you see in your outline, you actually subtract the gospel by adding the law. The first four verses of chapter five. Like we, like we talked about in the introduction, it, it never actually stops at a law we feel we can accomplish. We add one thing because it feels good. We can do this. But then this whole law is placed back on top of us. Second point, it's because it's, it's foolish to add the law. Why would you add this thing? Why put the unbearable and heavier than you can lift yoke back on your shoulders when Christ already took it? So there, there is no more yoke. And lastly, third, he did so by his perfect love, which fulfilled the law. So the entire law, as you hear from at the end of or the middle of Galatians 5, the entire law was fulfilled by Christ's perfect love for God and for neighbor. And that so you might freely and truly love both. As we read in Deuteronomy 6, is what we're supposed to do. Love the Lord your God. And Leviticus 19 says, Love your neighbors yourself. So I pray, I pray if, you, if you hear one thing, you hear this. In Christ, the whole law has been fulfilled that you might love God and love your neighbor. You know, that's a summary of the law, but that's not something we can do. And so Paul actually kind of gives us a trajectory of what the gospel does so that we can do this. And it's not out of obligation to the law. And so often we think this is how we can, we can better love God as we do this. 
It's how we get closer to God. It's how we feel his pleasure even more. But it's gratitude because it's been fulfilled that we can love. And we've, as we've heard so many times already in Galatians, it takes Paul's audience just as many times to hear as it does for us. He just pounds it and pounds it and pounds it over and over because it's good for us too. But our first point's subtracting by adding. Paul repeats himself in verse 1 because he says the same thing in verse 30 of chapter 4. Sometimes chapter divisions are good. Sometimes they can be a little unhelpful because we think they're separate from each other. When it's really just, it's a long statement that he's continuing. And notice, he's not indicting them. He's not saying, you forgot, so shame on you. He's, he's reminding them. He's reminding you. This falls on the heels, really, of he's completing the Hagar-Sarah allegory. Because he juxtaposes, he kind of opposes freedom and slavery in Hagar and, and Sarah. The freedom which we have in Christ. If you remember back to Galatians 2, when the Judaizers, their goal was to place them under the yoke of slavery. It says their purpose was to take away our freedom and to place us under slavery again. And Paul's purpose is to preserve the gospel and show you freedom. You don't have to take that yoke again. You don't have to take that. Hagar is the slave woman of Galatians 4. Very end of Galatians 4. She's the slave woman. But those of you born according to the promise who have faith in, in Jesus, you, like Isaac, are a child of the promise. And that's why he sets up this opposition. Like, you are of Sarah. Why are you acting like you're under Hagar? Why are you acting like you're under this? And notice, too, Paul doesn't start off this section, especially the following three verses, he doesn't start off by indicting the He doesn't start off by judging them, saying, why are, you, why are you believing this? He starts off by reminding them, this is what you're set free from. This is who you are. This is the freedom you have. He doesn't just say, doesn't look up at you and say, shape up. Foolish. How could you forget this incredible message by playing in the mud of the law. Look at yourself. He doesn't say that. That's probably what we think he should say. Why are you playing in the mud? He soothes them. He reminds them. He shows them and he shows you who you are. It's not who you can be or who you will be. This is who you are. Who you are in the gospel. That's why this is so incredible. In verses 2 through 4 is, is what happens when you add the law to the gospel. You think, well, maybe if I spruce it up a little bit, I'll feel a little better. Sometimes we need to feel beat up. Sometimes we need to feel like little scratches and bruises to feel good. Take, you take a balloon, if you take a balloon, and you poke a tiny little hole in it, it will still eventually deflate. doesn't matter how big or how small the, the hole is, it'll still deflate doesn't matter the size of what we're trying to add. It's that the, a hole has been added. Same thing. We add just a little bit of law. It's still the law. And it's still going to consume. If you take part in the ceremonies of the law, which Galatians 4 talks about, then circumcision is singled out because that's what they're talking about in Galatians 2 and 3, then, then Christ really doesn't do anything for you. You're not really looking for Christ to do anything for you. You think, I can do this. Maybe I start off with the gospel, but a little bit of law injected into my life isn't, too, isn't so bad. Again, notice what Paul is not saying. Circumcision is bad. The law is bad. He's saying they had their time and place. They were good. But circumcision is fulfilled. Filled in baptism. And the law no longer bears any judicial, so it's not how they set up their system. And no ceremonial functions. They were looking towards these festivals that pointed towards the Messiah to come, who brought in jubilation, who brought in joy. But now that Christ has come, they don't give you anything. 
front the point. They're, they're, they're gone. They're fulfilled. And not even that, they actually, bringing these back up, now that we have Christ and his work, they actually nullify Christ's work. It's not just you can have this plus Christ. They actually cancels each other out. Because taking these on as your standing before a holy God places the entire burden back on you. And it doesn't just have to be the ceremony. It can be like, well, I think this, this prayer time is what makes me right with God. Well, I think this Bible time is what makes me right with God. It's, it's this Instagram post. If I post enough of those, I'm going to feel pretty good. And verse 3 actually makes this point directly. This is what Christ will be of no advantage to you. Means. To take on this old covenant sign, again, good as it was at its time in history, he's not calling it bad. It was good at its time in history. If you take this old covenant sign on in this new covenant time, you're now wishing you were before Christ. Taking on all the stuff that was before Christ. So you're taking on the law. This is part of the law system. That's what they did. So Paul, without stating it, is probably alluding to the same text he referenced in Galatians 3.12 from Leviticus 18.5. You shall live by the law, and you shall do it. That's how you live. He's not saying it, but he's probably alluding to it again. And this is not only a Galatian problem with the old covenant law. Oh, that's back then. We don't really have that problem today. We're not really kind of worried about following ceremonial systems. We're not going to go to a feast of booze in the, like, the, next, the next day. It's too easy for us to inject, for us, as it was for them, a little cultural faith. You see things from culture like, that looks good. That looks good. Or we're just kind of born into it. And over time, over us practicing this, we kind of assume this is part of our faith. These cultural practices around this is part of our faith. But then eventually you come across those who are not part of your culture. You don't understand your culture. You, you see their culture like that's different than mine. And you begin thinking, I, I bet they do better or practice their faith better if they follow the pure faith. Because I do you assume this is what I do. This, this is purity. Paul, Paul is actually pushing against that. If they grow up under this system, they kind of assume this is, this is part of the gospel. And he's pointing it out in us. There may be, there may be some things we're not, we're not aware of that we're imposing on somebody else. It's definitely not part of the gospel. Something that's been so entrenched in our own culture that we assume... It's part of the gospel. We've been doing it for so long. Surely it's got to be part of this. Surely if they're not doing it, they got to start doing it. This, we assume that, that we exercise the pure faith. That we have the pure gospel. We start adding some stuff to it. It's like, well, that's what I do. You might ask, how, how might we do the same? What, what, what have we added to this and said, you have to follow this if you really want to follow the gospel. So in verse 4, he pinpoints the problem. You who would be justified, not by Christ, by the law. So that's the rub. When they're looking back to these systems, what they're really trying to do is, I think I can be justified by the law. I think I can do this thing on my own. It's not really just adding something to make us feel better. It's our attempt to justify ourselves in front of a holy God. Really what this is about. I think I can do it. Maybe with a little bit of help, a little bit of grace injected into me, I can do it. In Galatians 3, 17, Paul said, the law which came 430 years afterward, let's talk about the gospel, does not annul a covenant previously ratified by God. In verse 4 of this text, he says, if you want to be justified by the law, because that's what you're really doing, you are cut off from Christ. This is why you fall from grace. So he, it's kind of hypothetical in chapter 3. It's like, you're doing it. That's exactly what you're doing. The, the law didn't do this. You are. 
Because grace, the unmerited favor of God to forgive your sins and give you Christ's righteousness, it's is no longer yours if you want to earn God's favor on your own outside of Christ. Or if you just think you can do this thing on your own. Like, yeah, I'm moral enough. I can do this. I may not be perfect, but I'm, I'm better. I'm getting better. Like that's, if that's your standard, you're falling short. Like I said, in short, it, your, your effort will fall short. For Christ is the only way to be justified by, by God. It's like, you will be justified by the law. You, like, you will have some standing before the law. So whether or not you're in Christ being justified or the law is now condemning you. So you have to go against the law. There's no other question. So he's talking about this. And there's a reason why these efforts do nothing but subtract the gospel. It's because they don't do anything. That's why they're that's why they're foolish. They they don't do anything. This leads to point two, the folly of adding the law. There's, there's a subtle switch between verses two to four when Paul says you. And now he says we. So he switches. In verse five he begins, for through the spirit by faith, we ourselves eagerly awaits the hope of righteousness. What he says next, so from you who would be justified by the law of the previous verse to we ourselves eagerly await the hope of righteousness. He uses the same root word in both for righteousness. But they have drastically different results. Which, which one are you? The spirit of faith or spirit by faith is what gives you what verse 4 is condemning you against. You want to be justified by the law? Have the spirit. If you don't have the spirit, the law will not justify you. It's, it's what gives you or applies to you this righteousness. You thought you could earn it on your own, and so with a little help of the law, you're like, I think I can do this. With a little bit of help... I got this. And so Paul, Paul utilizes this basically the same construction elsewhere in Romans 8. He says, I'm eagerly awaiting the new creation. I can't wait until creation is not groaning anymore. When I'm not groaning any longer. When creation is not groaning any longer. He says the same thing for this hope of righteousness. We're eagerly awaiting this hope of righteousness. Saying, when righteousness will not only be mine, but righteousness will cover the world. It's not only just personal righteousness, it's when righteousness will be the only thing we know. But that's what I hope for. That's what I eagerly long for. That's Paul's hope. And he's saying that should be your hope too. Yes, personal righteousness. is like, we're waiting for the day when everything's righteous. That's, that's what we're waiting for. And he grounds this hope in verse 6. And this is where folly lies. This is where it's like, why would, you, why would you trust these things? You want to be justified by this outward act you do. That's what you're hoping for. This thing that I do. I'm the one who circumcises. Or Abraham circumcised. Like, that's a thing that we do. It's a promise, yes. But New Covenant, that's something I do. I'm trying to do. He says, have at it. Try your best. It doesn't even mean anything. It does nothing. The gospel transcends every culture. It transcends every tradition. It's because the gospel is the culture and it's the tradition. And this is why in the church you can find people from every nation... Because the gospel does not command you to deserve any current cultural traditions. Because it invites everybody from every culture. You don't have to take on circumcision. That's a, that's a Jewish rite of passage. It's a Jewish kind of entry into this covenant. You don't have to take that on. We're, we're, a, we're a people group of all of these. We're saying, but here's what does. If that doesn't transcend, here's what transcends. Faith 
working through love. That's what transcends cultures. And Paul will unpack love further in verses 13. It actually shows us what this love is. But what is the great commandment? What, is, what does Jesus tell those who approach him who want eternal life? He said, how can I gain, how can I get eternal life? What does he say? You shall love the Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and you shall love your neighbor as yourself. That's what transcends. We're like, I can't do that. How am I supposed to transcend if I can't do that? It's like doing that is what fulfills the law. Loving is what fulfills the law. But can you do this? So Paul returns in verses 7 to 10 to add to the folly of following the law. He doesn't just stop there like this. I'm going to go, I'm going to take this to its its logical end. Letting even a little bit of this seep into our thoughts. And we know our thoughts, they're filled with worry. We're like, am I doing this right? Am I figuring this out? Maybe, maybe I haven't done enough. Maybe if, if I just did a little bit more, Christ would accept me. As Paul said of himself in Galatians 2, 2, he turns to the Galatians. He says, I don't want to run in vain. And he turns to Galatians and says, you were running well. What happened? You knew this. You were running well. You, you know the truth. That's why you were running well. That's why, that's why it's such, such, such a shock. And you know who's called you. Abraham was called out of Ur to an unknown land. Hebrews 11, the preacher tells us this. He's looking to a land that's not on earth. But he's called. By the same one who still calls. The call hasn't changed, the person hasn't changed. Same one. But there's two people calling in Galatians 5. They want to call you. Call the Judaizers, those who want to add. Saying, you can do this. Come to us. Follow us. We got this thing figured out. And it could be really hard not to listen. I mean, not just be the Judaizers, it could be stuff we hear even today. It could be really hard not to listen. Say, so we're either we're on the right side of history, you better listen to us. Or we got this thing figured out. We're part of the, we're part of the group that you want to be part of. They've they've got really sweet words to tell us, and it's really hard not to be persuaded. They say, you can do it. You can do it. Just push a little harder. Pray a little harder. Be distinct. Have a little more faith. Maybe have a little more intense faith. Work a little harder this week and be closer. Many are calling to us. But you know the one who called you out from the law into his marvelous light, the sun. Would you drink from a gallon of water if you knew only a gram of poison was injected into it? So why would we add the smallest letter of the law to a pristine gospel? I think, I can do it. Does it make the gospel any sweeter? We know poison's been injected. Even if it's just a little bit, we know it's still been injected. Jesus said, beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. And then he would get it in Paul. And we think we know better. Like, nah, we got it. It's not that much leaven. Just a little bit. So Paul implores them to lean on the gospel. He implores you to lean on the gospel. For judgment has been placed. He says that. May the judgment go on them. So something has to be placed. Make, make no mistake about that. The question Paul is asked is, is not whether there's a judgment, but who bears it? Who has it? For some, the yoke is heavy. But you'd rather feel like you're under it. 
I trust myself, I still have a callus on my back. I'm used to it. But the yoke will drag the yoke will drag you with it. It will not leave and it will not lift. To take a piece of the law is to bear everything from the judgment. And yet, there is one who has come to bear the law on your behalf. Not one who has come to trouble you, as Paul said, they're trying to trouble you, but the one who took on your trouble and gave you his peace. You have no more trouble, you not have peace. This brings us to our last point. The love which fulfills the law. Paul, Paul starts off this, this session with quite possibly his most brilliant rhetorical move. It's not immediately apparent, but you'll see it. Like he's done before, he, he places the words of the Judaizers kind of in his mouth. It's kind of what they said, and now he places it back on him. Like, what if I said this? He's probably, he's probably speaking of his former life. Because he did preach circumcision in his former life. If he continued to proclaim circumcision, then the stumbling block of the cross would be removed. Because now the stumbling block is circumcision. It's no longer the gospel. The obstacle ceases being the atonement of Christ on our behalf, showing us we're sinners. You need somebody who can do this. And it's now, will you take circumcision? Can we do this on our own? He returns to those who troubled the Galatians and then pushes even further. Like if you really want to go all the way, let's go all the way. From a judgment placed on their, hand, on their heads to go all the way and cut yourself off. If you really want to cut off, let's do the, let's do the entire thing. It's almost, almost every other context that this word is used to, to emasculate or cut off is literally cutting off a limb. Like, if you want to want to get real with this, let's get real. Don't just cut off part, cut it off. I don't, I don't want to get too graphic, but I do want to drive this home. Circumcision is cutting off the foreskin. He says, why not just cut it off? Cut off the entire thing. If that's really what you want to debate, let's go all the way. For this is Paul's judgment, cutting off. That little part is kind of a thing for the whole. You're actually being cut off from the community. Not just part of yourself, but part of the community. You want to observe the law? Go all the way through it and cut yourself off. That's what following the law will do to you. And as if Paul's head turns on the soul, he's talking to them, and he turns it back to the Galatians, turns it back to us. To, from those he's indicted with the judgment of God to those he's comforting. He goes straight from an indictment and softens his tone and starts comforting. So for you, we're called to freedom. Only don't use that freedom as an opportunity for the flesh. But through love, serve one another. And he continues in verse 14. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. He begins closing this section in the same way he opened it. You are free, brothers. Free to obey. Filling in what he means in verse 6. Faith working through love. That's what it looks like. This is love. Loving your neighbor as yourself. Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. As the Apostle John says in 1 John, we love because he first loved us. And Christ loves us by loving the Lord with all of his heart. And he did this. He did love the Lord with all of his heart. By observing. By doing. 
Christ doesn't believe in himself. He doesn't believe in himself to justify us. He does to justify us. He merits to justify us. He loves by obeying. That's what love is. Loves by obeying. And he loves his neighbor, you, as himself by being obedient for you. He obeys the Lord and he obeys for you. That's love. And you are no longer slaves under the law. You are now beloved of Christ. And you now love the law. That's a change. Where from the law is now condemning me to, I now love the law. Only one person can do that. Some of you may be asking, can, can I then do anything I want if Christ has taken my punishment away from me? kind of seems like a get-out-of-jail-free card. Think of it this way. If you're always trying to earn your spouse's love, or your parents, or your employer's favor, you'll never feel like they're doing enough. they never feel like they're giving you enough in return. It'll never satisfy you or this aisle you set up in your heart. You'll always feel like you have to do more. Surely they can love me more. Surely they can accept me more. Surely I have to do more to do this. But if, if you know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you are loved, how much freer can you love? Can you love your spouse, your parents, or joyfully labor under an employer who cares for you? Cares for you not because of the work you do, but because you cares for you. She cares for you. So you work from the position of perfectly righteous. So much freer to truly love because you were first loved. That's where this comes from. That's what Paul's talking about. That's where it's free to do whatever we want. We're free to not actually love. Actually and truly love. So Paul summarized the law with one word, which has been filled which has been fulfilled, that you may now actually do the opposite of verse 15. What you must obey in verse 3, if you dip a finger into the law, then the purity of the gospel has been obeyed by Christ. Recall the picture of Galatians 2, those verses 11 to 14, when, when Peter is called out as a hypocrite. You know this, and you're a leader of the church. Why are you leading others astray with you? Where's he at? He's at a feast. He's fellowshipping. They're eating together. So Paul goes back to this picture. He left eating with the Galatians because the Jews came in. Like, I can't love you anymore. Maybe eating together, but we're not brothers. So Paul returns to this very image in Galatians 5.15. That's what love looks like. If you attempt to observe the law on your own, that's what happens. You will bite off. You will consume. It may not be immediately, but it will happen. You'll find differences. Like, I can't, can't do this with you. I can't commune with you. I can't fellowship with you. You're different than me. However, if you confess Christ's name, you no longer devour one another. You now feed on Christ. And that's the one who gives us unity. You will love one another instead of consuming one another. No longer fighting, it's now loving. So how do we live this out as we end? It's, it sounds simple, but it's do you rest in what's been done. You don't say, I, I, gotta, I gotta do more. I gotta add a little bit more. It, it's so easy to add. We know this. We like, we like working. We like sweating. We like feeling at the end of the day, I did, a, I did a good day's work. We like feeling this. So we add a little bit of requirements. We add some conditions and a host of other things of the message, Christ and him crucified. Like that's way too simple. There's got to be more than this. Our to-do list grows and we forget that it's too done. It's, this is done. If you have not yet confessed Christ as the one who has fulfilled 
the obligations of the entire law on your behalf, hear this. As Paul said, the demands of the law will crush you. It's not if, it's, it's when. When will it crush you? If your own standards and that of the cultures haven't already done so, that doesn't do it, it will. This freedom Paul proclaims in Galatians 5 can be yours when you realize you're actually not free. Why we're free to do whatever. It's so we're actually not free. We're under the, the, the good master, we're under the world's master. Trust that Christ's work to bear your curse has set you free that you might truly love. We are loved so that we can love. We're not loving as one who's trying to earn affection. We love because we already have affection. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for what you've done for us and your son. We thank you that though we have forgotten so many times, we forget our freedom. We forget what you've done to set us free from your law. We, we so often act like <coughs> slaves under Hagar. We don't have this freedom, but we do. You've shown us. And Lord, we have to be reminded of this every single week, every single day, every single second of the day, so that we are free. This is true of us now, not just in eternity, although we could consummate in eternity. We have this freedom now. We can love in this freedom. May we love even today. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen.